Hey friends, welcome to Embrace the Question. This is the third time I have done this video. So you would think that my presentation would be completely polished and this will be the best video ever. Hey guys, welcome back. I appreciate you spending a few minutes with me and watching this video, really do. I was recently notified by somebody I didn't know who called me and told me that they didn't understand a line that was on my church website. It was it's part of our mission statement and I couldn't really understand immediately what she was referring to. I went back and looked at it and the statement is, we help others have dominion over the snakes in their garden. And her comment was, what in the world do these people believe? <laughs> well, here, here's the reason that that was written. It's why it's part of our, our mission statement. It is allegorical. It comes from a teaching that I did a while back. And this is just a little part of it. See, I tend to overgeneralize or maybe even oversimplify simplify in order to make a point or to get a picture to work. And here's the picture that I saw. I'm talking about out of Genesis, we see that Adam was created and he was created out of the dirt. He came up out of the ground, right? And I believe that is maybe, again, a generalization, but one of our first pictures of baptism where something dead comes out of the ground, comes to life. And as we know, God blew his breath into Adam and Adam became a living being. And I think that God looked him square in the eye and said, hello, son, I am well pleased with you. We know that Adam was given dominion over a garden and we all have gardens. Our lives are gardens, and we were commissioned to have dominion over those gardens. Well, how did Adam do? Well, he didn't do too well. He encountered a snake. Isn't there always a snake in the garden? In this case, there definitely was. He and Eve encountered this snake. Neither one of them did very well in handling the snake's attack. But Adam, being a son, had a commission to have dominion over that snake, but he failed. So we can fast forward a little bit to the next son in scripture that is identified, and that would be, still in Genesis, Israel. Jacob is renamed to Israel, and Israel becomes a nation of people. He has 12 sons, and those 12 sons have a multitude of people become the which become the, the nation of Israel, right? And when they are in captivity in Egypt, God says to Moses, "Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, for Israel is my son." What is his name and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. You are careless with Torah. God does not have a son except Israel. Israel is his only son. All of us. Suit yourself. Okay. So Israel is coming out of that captivity, out of Egypt. They, they too experience a type of baptism. They go through the waters of the Red Sea and come out on the other side. Right? What happens? The seas close. All of Pharaoh's army, including himself, is destroyed, right? They see the bodies of their enemies floating, and they're victorious, and they're singing God's praises for a day or two at least. Remember, that was supposed to be a quick trip to the promised land. That was the intent. But they turned it into a 40-year trip because of unbelief. And in that 40 years they experienced snakes. Now Moses, who wrote these accounts, he writes it like, we grumbled against 
God, and God sent among us snakes. And the snakes bit the people, and we were dying. And that's when they made the brass serpent, put it on a pole, and all who looked upon it lived, right? Remember the story. But, again... Israel, the son of God, had a chance to have dominion over snakes, and they did not do it. You say, well, it really, it really was a supernatural thing. It was God's judgment. There's no way they could have had dominion over those snakes. Except for a, another verse, which I will post here, that seems to indicate that God didn't necessarily send those snakes upon them. He said, I led you through the wilderness where there were scorpions, there were serpents. He made it sound like, hey, you're going through a wilderness. There's going to be serpents. There's going to be scorpions. There's going to be lack of water. There's going to be lack of bread. You're going to have to completely depend on me. And the less grumbling you do, the better off you would, you would be. All that to say... It sounds to me like it's possible they might could have had some dominion over some snakes, but they didn't. Okay, let's fast forward again to the third son mentioned in Scripture, which is Jesus himself. We know that Jesus came out of the water of baptism again. Remember, baptism is a, is a key element here. He comes out of the water of baptism after being baptized by John the Baptist, and the, the heavens open up, a dove descends, or the spirit descends like a dove, and you hear the voice, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. His identity is established. His mark of excellent is, excellence is stamped by the Father himself. And Jesus goes where? He goes immediately into the wilderness to face that snake. And what's more, Jesus did not have 40 years to spend in the wilderness. He only had 40 days. So we see the picture still applies. And we see that for the first time, a son did not fail. Jesus showed us how to handle that snake. Interesting, isn't it? So one of my conclusions is that it is a son's right to face the snake. Only a son has the right and the ability to crush the snake. Now, we, as I said, we still have snakes in our gardens, but it is our commission, our job, to have dominion over those snakes. That, that was the point of what I wrote on the church website. It was, our, it is our responsibility to have dominion over the snakes in our garden, and it is our, it is our privilege to help others have dominion over the snakes in their garden. But Jesus was the first to show us how it's done. And we see, it would be a great material for another video, we see that the snake tempted him in three primary ways, and those are the three primary ways he tempts us. So by looking at Jesus' example, we can see how to defeat the snake whenever he comes to, to, to tempt us. That's the crux of it. It is a son's right, a son's privilege to crush the head of the snake. Now remember John 1, for those who believe in Jesus, for those who believe in his name, they are giving, given the authority to become sons of God. We are in Christ Jesus through a new covenant. So we too have that very same authority to crush the head of the snake whenever it appears in our garden. I hope this teaching blessed you, gave you something new to think about, maybe revealed a picture you hadn't seen before. I, uh, I invite you to subscribe if you like this kind of thing. But I really appreciate you hanging out with me for a few minutes, and I will see you on the next video. Peace.